All right, IBSL1, we are back to talk about more rational functions, but today's lesson is kind of interesting because we're talking about rational functions in only a certain form. Before we get to that form, um, let's talk about rational functions in general. Rational functions just means that it's some sort of uh, function over a function. Um, those top and bottom functions can be any polynomials. So you could have like a quadratic over a quadratic or like a linear over a cubic or something like that. There's tons of different weird combos of rational functions. But today we're just going to talk about uh, the top and bottom being linear functions. So if this top was linear and this bottom was linear, like a y equals mx plus b, you would get a rational function in this form, ax plus b over cx plus d. So that's all the functions we're gonna talk about today are in that form and we're gonna talk about how they behave. The first thing I wanna talk about is a vertical asymptote. So every rational function, ha well, I shouldn't say that. The rational functions we're gonna talk about today all have vertical asymptotes and horizontal asymptotes. The way you figure out where a vertical asymptote is it's all about the denominator. So vertical asymptotes are when the denominator is equal to zero. Uh, there's a big math rule that says you can never ever divide anything by zero. So if you try to do it on a graph, the graph freaks out and gets close to it but can never truly get there. So that's when you get these vertical asymptotes. So to find a vertical asymptote, so here, the vertical asymptote is going to be when cx plus d is equal to zero. Now, the book makes a big deal about how you can, you know, subtract d and divide by c, so the equation of the vertical asymptote is negative d over c, but I don't really memorize that. All I do is just remember this important fact, that it's when the denominator is equal to zero. So if you want to find a vertical asymptote, set the denominator equal to zero and solve. That's where your vertical asymptote is going to be. Now a horizontal asymptote, this one's a little bit more conceptual about why this trick works the way it does. So. Uh, horizontal asymptotes, if you think about, here, I'll sketch a quick graph, just, you know, if we have some sort of horizontal asymptote like this, let's say you have some sort of rational function, the cobwebs in the corners that look like this. So the horizontal asymptote is like, if you get really, really, really far out to the right or really, really, really far out to the left, the horizontal asymptote, asymptote totes, excuse me, uh, keep getting closer and closer and closer to that horizontal line. So this is happening as your x's get really, really big. In fact, as they go out to positive infinity or as they go out to negative infinity. So if you look at this equation right here, I want you guys to just think about if we were to replace this and this with really, really big numbers. So if you had like A times, uh, what's the biggest number you can think of? Kajillion? Let's just put billions here. Um, plus B over C times billions plus D, like this part right here, when you multiply A times like, you know, um, 100 million billion or something like that, you get A 100 million billions. But the more important thing is that this part right here, the plus B really becomes insignificant because that's like a plus two or a minus five or something like that. But when compared with this part, it's so small that it actually doesn't really matter as you go out towards infinity. So, let me get rid of my highlighters. Um, what happens is these parts right here kind of go away as the top and bottom get bigger and bigger and bigger. So you get like A billions over C billions. 
And then you can kind of think of like the billions as canceling out and you just get A over C. So in general, when you have a linear over a linear, oops, your horizontal asymptote is going to be at y is equal to a over c. It's the ratio of the leading coefficients. So those are two big, big tricks we're going to be using today. Setting the denominator equal to zero to find the vertical asymptote and taking the ratio of the leading coefficients to find the horizontal asymptote. Let's use it. First up, we're going to sketch this 4x plus 1 over 2x minus 6. Because it's linear over linear, I can use all the tricks that we just talked about. If it wasn't linear over linear, it doesn't work like that. Um, first thing I'm going to do is find the vertical asymptote by setting that to zero. So vertical asymptote is 2x minus 6 is equal to zero. So add 6, divide by 2, you get x is equal to 3. So that's our vertical asymptote. The horizontal asymptote is going to be 4 over 2 because it's the ratio of the leading coefficients. So... The horizontal asymptote is y is equal to 4 over 2, or y is equal to 2. So if I start to sketch this, x is equal to 3 is the vertical. So it's like... Ch -ch 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 -ch. Vertical asymptote at x is equal to 3. Horizontal at x, y is equal to 2. Now, you guys, the question becomes, are the cobwebs in these corners or these corners? So I've struggled with whether or not like to come up with rules based off this, but I think the simplest way I like doing it lately is just plugging in an X value and seeing what comes out of it. And I think a very easy X value to plug into any function is what happens at when X is equal to zero. So if you replace X with zero, Oops. you get negative one-sixth, which means that the point zero, negative one-sixth is on the function, which means that's like somewhere around here. So because we know this point is on the cobwebs, we know that they have to be, that there's a cobweb in that corner. So, I think based off this point, you can say that there's a cobweb here, and then there's always a cobweb in the opposite corner as well. I think this is sufficient to be a sketch of this function because I've labeled my asymptotes, um, I found an intercept, the cobwebs are in the right corners. If it just says sketch, I think this is fine, totally good. So, test a point, figure out where your cobwebs are, they're always opposite corners. Well, with linear over linear. Next up, use a least common denominator to solve this equation. Please notice the denominators of 2x and x plus 1. That means the least common denominator would be those two things multiplied together. So, what we're going to do is take both sides and multiply them by the least common denominator. So... The least common denominator is going to be 2x times x plus 1. And then this will get multiplied with 3 over 2x. Take away 2x over x plus 1. And this is equal to negative 2, but still times the co least common denominator. So you blast both sides with the least common denominator. Now, let's just focus on the left-hand side. Um, you can think of this as like a coefficient that's going to get distributed to this fraction and to this fraction. When you distribute to this first fraction here, here, um, the 2x and 2x are going to cancel each other out, but the x plus 1 will be left over. 
So we'll have 3 times x plus 1 for that spot. Then when I distribute to the second one, the x plus 1s will cancel out and we'll be left with 2x times 2x. And then this is all equal to the other side, which is, I'm not even gonna touch it yet. Now let's play a whole lot of cleanup. Distribute, that's negative four x squared. Over here, you can think of negative two times two x as negative four x, but then we're gonna distribute that to both of these terms. So that's negative four x squared minus four x. So then you might look at this and be like, oh no, a gnarly quadratic, what am I gonna do? But you guys notice this negative four X squared and negative four X squared, if I add that to both sides, it's gonna completely go away. So it's actually a sneaky linear in disguise. So let's see, let's add four X to both sides and subtract three. So you get seven X is equal to negative three. So X is equal to negative three seconds. If I were you, I would totally go back to the OG problem and plug that in and make sure there's no zeros in the denominator. But that doesn't create zeros in the denominator. Last problem. F of X equals X minus four over three X minus two. Find the inverse. OMG, the inverse. That was so long ago. You guys, uh, with inverses, you just swap the X and the Y. So we get X is equal to Y minus four over 3y minus 2, and we have to try to get y by itself. First thing I am going to do is multiply both sides by this denominator to get rid of the fractions. So we get x times 3y minus 2 is equal to y minus 4. Then I'm going to distribute this x to the 3y and the negative 2. So we get 3xy minus 2x is equal to y minus 4. Now, I'm going to get anything with a Y on the left-hand side and anything without a Y on the right-hand side. So I'm gonna move things around. Um, 3XY, I'm just gonna let chill over here, but then this Y, I'm gonna subtract over to the other side. And then this negative 2X, I'm gonna to add to the other side. So we get 2X minus four. Now, the reason I got everything with Y on one side is now both of these terms have a Y in common and you can factor it out. And then there's only one y, and we can divide both sides by this, 3x minus one. And then we're done. So f to the negative one of x is 2x minus four over 3x minus one. Hey, pop quiz, hotshot. What would the vertical and horizontal asymptotes of that be? You should be able to tell me that. All right, guys. Um, there's a word problem in the book. For example, seven. Please look that over. Email me if you have any questions.